is trustworthy and true. How many believers around us can see and say that we have an excellent spirit, an extraordinary spirit? What about the people we work with? How many unbelievers can say, say to us, just as they said about Joseph, the, surely the hand of the Lord is upon him? You see, if unbelievers cannot see the light of God, that excellence and that faithfulness in us, they will never see God. You can preach the gospel all you want. It's just words. Excellent spirit. These, are pic these pictures of faithfulness are what God expects to see in believers because we are his children. So we look like him. Is God unfaithful? No, we know he's faithful. Is God not excellent? He's excellence. He's, he he's beyond what we know what excellence is. But the fruit, okay, th this is the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, 22 to 24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against there is no law. And those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So these are pictures of faithfulness that God expects us to cultivate in our lives so that we can stand out for him. We can finish the race. We can complete his mission. We can do everything that is marked out for us, for each one of us, that he was sent. We were sent to do on earth. We were not born here like to, you know, God didn't put us on earth just that we can be so happy doing our own things. He has a mission for us. He has a mission. There is no one born by accident even those who are unplanned for. None. Faithfulness is the characteristics that gets God's full attention. I like that. He has full eyes. His eyes are upon you. Let's look at um, Psalms 101 verse 6. Psalms 101. One hundred and one verse six. My eyes shall be upon be on the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way, he shall serve me. But I want to concentrate on that first part. My eyes shall be on the faithful of on the land, that they may dwell with me. Wow. If we want God's full attention, if we want to be the apple of God's eye, we must learn to cultivate faithfulness. Let's look at um, the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25, 20 to 30. Um, I'm just, you know, um, looking at a portion of that um, passage, okay? So we'll see how God views Faithfulness and unfaithfulness, starting from verse 20. Okay, Matthew. Okay. So he had... So he who had received five talents came and brought, um, let's see. Okay, brought five talents saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside it. So 
So the Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So we see here, both this, uh, these two servants were found faithful and, and they doubled what God entrusted to them. They were faithful with the few things entrusted to them. And the response of God to their faithfulness was this. He commended them as having done well, good and faithful. And as a reward, God made them ruler, ruler over many things. And I like this other part. They entered into his joy. You know, you can have so many blessings, but you cannot. Sometimes people don't enjoy it's very sad. I've seen many rich people, but they're so miserable. But we want to be rewarded by the Lord at the same time with joy. That's what is so good about the Lord being inside everything that we do. And continuing on, verse 24. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew to be you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Therefore, you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I would receive back my own with interest. Therefore, take the talents from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For everyone, for to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away." And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. They will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we see God's response to this unfaithful servant was one of anger. Hmm. He called this unfaithful servant, you wicked and lazy, unprofitable. Wow, those are strong words from God. If you, you ever an employer says that about you, you want to run. God also took that very one talent, only one talent, took it away from him and gave it to the one with the ten. That's how God responds to unfaithfulness. Even what you have, he'll take it away. When we are when we are faithful to God, he will entrust us with more. Instead of entering into the joy of the Lord, he was cast into sorrow and torment. And this is one of the many re one reasons why many Christians suffer from torment and sorrow. Because they have not been faithful. You know, sometimes they may not experience the consequences straight away but it will surely come if they don't repent and get back on the race of faithfulness. It is very important for us to pay heed to the principles in, in that parable. I'm going to address this uh, subject of faithfulness uh, in two directions, okay? The way of cultivating faithfulness and also the function of faithfulness. But gradually, because it's hard to kind of separate them, so they will kind of merge in different places, right? But I want you to think about, you know, how the, you know, the direction I'm going, cultivating faithfulness and the function of it. So we learn from this parable that the first function of faithfulness is, is God wants to equip us to be his good steward. God has a reason for, for giving us things. 
It's not make. It's not like a child. You know, you give something to a child. They're so happy. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. I'm gonna do, you know, everything with it. And and somebody, if any other child wants to take, lay hold of it, no, it's mine. That that's not the intention when God gives us something. He has a purpose. He wants to teach us how to be good stewards. He wants to train us to be responsible with his spiritual gifts and, the, and, and all the other things he gives you. God can only fully entrust us with treasure, his treasures if we are faithful. God is not going to entrust you with things that are so precious to him if you are unfaithful. I'll give you an example. Would you, if you have your child, you entrust it to anybody? No, you will check that person out to see if that person is trustworthy, if he's, he or she is, you know, is reputable in character. You're not going to entrust anybody with your kid. And you're not going to entrust anybody to come to your house, take care of your house. If you, if they're, you know they are thieves, they are not trustworthy. We won't. And why, why, why would God not have the same principle? The other thing we learned here is that uh, from this parable, we have to start with little things. It's funny, though, because um, I started with so many big ministries, and here, right now, I'm having this small. But I know God is saying, you have been faithful over big. Will you stay faithful over the little? I get the picture, Lord. <laughs> I get the picture. Because the pressures of men are going to do this to you. You are doing something wrong. I search my heart, but now I understand God is testing me, training me to be faithful regardless, big or small. Being faithful over little things is a way of cultivating that fruit of faithfulness. For example, if, you, if people are unfaithful coming to church, you know, how on earth can we entrust them in a ministry? Because the things of God is holy and precious to him. We cannot have anybody. I've made mistakes. You see, because I'm a nice, I, I like to be nice. So I always give people a benefit of a doubt. And that benefit of a doubt sometimes getting me into big problem with God. So now I learn. I learn only who God chooses. And even if you are in ministry, you can still be unfaithful in your attitude towards him. Huh? There are many people who, who do ministry, very faithful, but the attitude is a problem. God expects faithfulness in attitudes too. Um, I shared this uh, on Thursday night, and it really spoke to me. Um, Jeremiah chapter 48, verse 10. Um, I'm going to read from the complete Jewish Bible um, that you can look at um, the verse that you have. And it says here, A curse on him who does the work of Adonai carelessly. How many of us are so careless in ministry? And we don't know that the word of God has been decreed, a curse on him who does the work of Adonai carelessly. When God decrees something, it goes. 
Many Christians expect God to understand their situation, okay? Of not, for example, not honoring the assembling together, of not honoring the Sabbath, you know? They, they want God to understand, you know, surely God understands my situation. God is very understanding, it's true. But you know what we are doing? We are telling God, God, please understand and fit into our plans and situation. Hmm. Shouldn't it be the other way around? We fit into God's plan. You don't make excuses so that he can fit into our plans. When we think like that, then God is no longer God over our lives. We are in charge of our lives because we expect God to fit into our plans. Fitting into God's plans requires faithfulness to Him. Second function of cultivating the fruit of faithfulness has to do with building our relationship with God. We stress so much about building relationship with God, intimacy with God. You see, why is that so important? Because when we, in our faithfulness, build that relationship with God, we can hear God clear. Let's look at uh, Moses, the example of Moses. Um, Numbers chapter 12, 6 to 8. Numbers, numbers, numbers. Numbers chapter 12, 6 to 8. Okay, this is the, the, the uh, incident about Miriam and Aaron, okay? And verse 6, it says, Then he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision, and I will I'll speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses, he is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly, and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? You see, Moses was faithful in all all of God's house. I want to emphasize all because sometimes we deceive ourselves thinking we are faithful, but you know what? There are some, some areas we are not faithful in. Many times we can be enthusiastic and faithful doing the things we like, but the problem comes when it is doing the things we don't like. I have to admit to you all, oh, to the Ugandans here, when to God told me last year to go to Uganda, I was, fear just came all over me because I didn't want to go to Africa. Why? Because of misinformation. And also because I read so many testimonies of great men of God who died in Africa. I said, God, I don't want to die in Africa. I admit, I was scared. Now what do I do? Do I obey God? So it's funny that uh, Brother Nick, two, I think two Thursdays ago, he said, oh, you're like Esther. If I perish, I perish. And I think, oh, <laughs> that was exactly what I said. God, if I perish, I perish, I'll go. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on there. <laughs> But I said, you know, if it's you, it's you, you know. I perish, I perish. I didn't. I really enjoy myself. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, God, you're so merciful to me. <laughs> I didn't like doing it, but I went. I went. And oh, what a joy it was to enter into the joy of the Lord. There was a joy that I could not understand being faithful and the joy that he gives me. <clears throat> Did we think that Jesus liked the idea <laughs> that he was sent to earth 
and ultimately he's going to die for the sins of the whole world? We, we can see that he wasn't that excited, but he was willing, you see. Why, why did he say in Gethsemane, okay? Uh, you don't have to go there. He said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. So he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed saying, oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not I will, but as you will. Jesus was faithful to the end. That was an unpleasant thing. You see, we, you think it's just dying. But you see, he, when he was on the cross, the sins of the world, he is sinless. The sin of the whole world is on him. Everything that he did not know was on him. That part is the part that is hard. Every filthy thing was on him. Now, there is a flaw in a teaching, um, in this teaching that, you know, our natural gifts and talents, you know, or what we enjoy doing is a clear indication that that's where God wants us to serve him. It may be correct sometimes, but most of the time it's not correct. This is a flaw. And that's why people in church say, oh, I don't really like doing it. Okay, I'll wait some more for God to show me the things I like to do. And so they can wait, and they can wait, and wait, and wait, and wait. Let's look at David. You see, it is more natural for David to be a shepherd than a king. But God raised him up to be a king. Why? Because he was faithful. He was faithful as a shepherd, and he was a worshiper. And God chose him and raised him up to be a king. Joseph, it was more natural for Joseph to be by the father's side because he's the favorite always, you know. He got the, the, the coat, you know, he was the favorite. It was natural for Joseph to be by his father's side all the days of his father's life. But Joseph was faithful in Egypt, going through every circumstances that was difficult, he chose to be faithful to God, and God raised him up to be the second in command. His faithfulness, was it natural for him? So let's think about some of the things that we, we consider as the truth. Every time I see that I'm dogmatic about certain things, God will just shake me up. And he will bring in another inside revelation to show me I don't know everything. So don't have to be so dogmatic about what you believe in certain things because we don't know it all. And this is one area that God taught me. I was so dogmatic about it. So if you are complaining about why you cannot hear God, perhaps you are not being faithful in all things to God. Of course, you know, hearing God's voice is a progression, you know, as you build intimacy with him, you know. But I have to, you know, there's so much confusion here about this hearing God's voice. And many times when people are not clear about certain things, they will run to every Tom, Dick, Dick and Harry for, for, you know, some advice, for some, you know, feedbacks. You know, you have to understand only those who, who have been hearing God, you know, I'm not saying every time, but, you know, hearing God clearly, you know, and being able to follow God faithfully, those are the persons you talk to. Because they, they are in that rightful position to help you. You see, Gordon and Preacher, don uh, preacher Donkey, I mean, Preacher, <laughs> 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 preacher Donkey. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he preached a message about donkeys, right? And he was saying that the donkeys were more obedient and faithful to God's word because they, hear, they heard God and they did, and that donkey obeyed God. So many times, it's, 
why we're not hearing God? Because he knows you're not going to listen and obey him. So he doesn't tell you. God does not waste his words on people who will not obey him. He will give you a few chances, but after a while, if you're, you just won't listen, he's going to stop talking. And that's that. I don't want that to happen. I want him to be speaking to me every day. Every day, even if he has to rebuild me, I'd rather hear his voice. Amen. You see, God does not like speak to us so that we can rejoice. Hey, 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 I heard God's voice. You know, you're so excited like a little kid. Oh, God spoke to me today. That's not the purpose why God <laughs> speaks to you, okay? Just to make you happy. He speaks so that he can entrust you with what he wants you to do, regardless of the circumstances. That's why he speaks to you. Sometimes he speaks to you to encourage you on in whatever you are going through. But he always have a purpose when he speaks. Many times when we, we want to share God's voice for our own benefit, correct? Not interesting, not interested in hearing his voice to do his will. Sometimes we rebuke him when he tells us something. No, that's, that can be God. I still remember that one time when, you know, I was in Bible college first year, and I didn't have very much, and the Lord spoke to me, you need to, you need to give uh, your roommate, you need to pay for her, her first term semester fees. The, the first response was, that can be God, I rebuked that. <laughs> Interesting is this. She would be kicked out of college if she don't pay up so on the on the last week when I saw that she was packing really packing to go so I said okay I pay you see we don't understand that when God instruct us with something he has a great plan ahead of us but we have to be faithful right at that first point so what happened is I said okay God I did this now now I will have to leave college you know before three years because I don't have that money but I think about two weeks later, some of you have heard this, two weeks later, an Australian couple, I have no idea where they got my name. The interesting thing is they had my full name. Most people in Malaysia know me as Christina. They don't know my full name. I don't want to tell the full name on TV. You can ask me later. <laughs> So that was a surprising thing. They paid for all my years of tuition to hear God's voice and obey brings great benefit that we don't even know later. But many times we don't want to hear his voice to do his will. We just want him to do something for us. Okay, the second way of how to cultivate faithfulness is related to money. Huh? This determines if we are totally separated unto God in faithfulness or to Naaman. No man can serve two masters and be totally faithful to both. So, example. That's why a man with wives, you know, two wives or mistresses or concubines or whatever you want to call them, porcupines. <laughs> I've heard this before. It was funny. Um, you know, continually has this headache. Why? Because, you know, the wives are all vying for his faithfulness. How can that be? So he has this headache. In Proverbs chapter 6, verse 26, this is funny. Proverbs, let's, let's read this. This is really funny. And Bill is not here, but, you know, I, I, did, I did this. Um, I'm still doing Proverbs with Bill. You know, I go to his house, you know, every Saturday, every Tuesday to, to, to help him, you know, um, with the word of God. And uh, when I came to this, he just burst out laughing, okay? Proverbs chapter 6, verse 26. Did I get it right? Yeah. For by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread. 
man, think, think some more before you have all this following after you. <laughs> You'll be reduced to a crust of bread. <laughs> And of course, women too today. Unfortunately, many of us, even ministers, have failed to get past this test of God, fully God or Maimon. If we are able to pass this test, then God can entrust us with true riches. You see, his true riches has to do with his revelation, making known his mysteries, you know, and his secrets. He tell you the secret of his heart and everything that pertains to spiritual prosperity. And you have the bonus of abounding in other blessings. That is total faithfulness to God. Now, how does money affect our faithfulness to God? You see, money in itself is not evil, but the love of it affects our faithfulness to God. First, in our thoughts. We are thinking money, and, and then we are thinking more and more how to make more money. Our mind is not stayed on Christ, you know. Um, it is on money. It divides our, our affection. That's why I was talking, I, I felt, you know, today that undivided attention was so powerful. It divides our affection and trust in God. Second, money takes away our time from being faithful to God. How? Well, we, we, you know, time. When you, you spend time, you know, trying to plan how much money to make, it's time. You could spend time with him, but it's all those things that you're thinking of. And it takes away your time serving him because there are, there, there are cases I've heard, you know, in Singapore. You know, they just have to work. They say if we don't work hard, you know, all through the night, then maybe we are the next guy to be sacked. We may lose our job. And so you have people not being able to serve God. Third, money causes us to accumulate more possession that we really need. We accumulate. And, and because of that, we are no longer faithful to the cause of God, to the things that he wants us to do. For example, we were talking about orphans and widows. With all this money, somebody says, said to me, no, not just somebody, a few. He said, your, your house is so crammed. There's five of you. How do you live in a house that small, five of you? Why don't you get a bigger house? The temptation is there because I don't like things to be cluttered. You know, to have a house big enough to put things away nicely, hmm, that has a good feeling for me. Flavia, say amen, right? <laughs> but then I said, you know what? If I get a bigger house, then the, then, the, then the children that we are supporting, we, we probably cannot support them all. We probably have to cut a few out. And the money we're trying to save up for missions, um, I guess we have to cut out debt out too. You see how accumulation of possession can take away our cause for God to be faithful? It's so sneaky. I think we survived 10 years in that house of course, we were sometimes like, oh, but we survived 10 years. We're fine. So praise God. I used to live in a big house, seven bedrooms, 5,000 square feet. It was so huge. I didn't know what to do with that house. I don't talk about the cleaning. But I do, I still pray that, you know, at least one more room. But anyway, that's up to God. If he wants to give, it'll be fine. But, you know, until then, no. We'll stay where we are so that we can advance the cause of God. Be faithful to his cause. Now, the third way on how to cultivate fruit of faithfulness is staying in the presence of God. And on Sunday, I, 
I preached that in the Indonesian church. I, I don't know about that, but it was such a strong message that I went home and I'm thinking, oh, these people must hate me now. <laughs> Um, John chapter 14, verse 23. John chapter 14, verse 23. It says here, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him, and we will come to him and make a home with him. So when we, when we are staying in the presence of God, we are continually conscious of him, and we want to please him. We are so conscious of him. Um, Jesus dwelt in the presence of God um, in you don't have to go there, but if you want, it's fine. It's, it's John chapter 14, verse 11. It states that Jesus is in the Father, and the Father is in him. That is why Jesus could speak what the Father told him to speak and do what the Father told him to do because he was in that constant presence of God, the awareness of God, staying in the presence of God. And, and this is what God says to, about Jesus. He said to him, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Let's be faithful. If, let's, let's make God happy by, by our faithfulness because it pleases him. It pleases him. Jesus completed his mission on earth. Will we? Will we be faithful to complete the mission of God that we were created for on earth? Paul finished the race. He did not drop out. He fought the good fight. He held on to his faith. Will we be faithful to finish the race marked out for us? Faithfulness pleases God. And uh, we have said that, you know, his eyes are on us. He, his full attention is, is upon us, and we will be rewarded. We will definitely be rewarded, as we saw in the parables. Let's pray.